Yeah, that's because I'm using other space. Oh, that's Probably true. That's true. I, yeah, if but, I can. Yeah, but the, about the two uh, stuff that you're talking about, there are two indexes. So we have lots of jobs indexes. This index is going to give us a situation of the precipitation, the flow moisture, the the flow level in the river. So they will give us that kind of information. Okay. And the climatic indexes will give us the information about the climate, like what will happen to the kind of predicting based on the climate change and based on the job indexes predicting the future what will happen to so in a specific area. And based on data mining, because there, there are lots of data available for each region. So we, we sort out the data and manage the data and we can get information about the future. But I am just starting so probably uh, when I go further in I can explain more. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel like it's nice to know what's in the index is, yeah, what kind exactly. of information is in yeah, there. Yeah. And probably if I load the audience with lots of names of indexes, you will be called, you will lost, you know. I, I can name lots of indexes, but I didn't want to get straight off the topic. <laughs> so well, let me just uh, draw some uh, intersections between um, my where a teacher journalist is, scientists don't write like you. Okay, and that's not wrong, it's just different. And we teach scientists the same thing. So typically scientists are used to um, setting up a story with lots of context and then ending it with results. And what we tell journalists, if you want to decide if you want to write a story or not, just get to the bottom of the, of the thing, look very, very quickly, and that'll tell you if there's a story there or not. And, and then start talking to the scientists about that. And then sometimes scientists push back and say, oh, you're missing all the context. You're not interested in the context. Well, the journalist is interested in the context, but they're interested in the context five or six paragraphs down. Okay. They want to start with the story with the news. Okay. So to me, where you started, I think that important information, it's not the start of the story. I think the start of the story is I'm trying to predict drought in Africa. You know, that's wow. And my first thought, how do you do that? Okay. Yeah. And which sounds like you do that. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, and, and this is important because well, why is that important? Drought is the worst thing ever, and it costs 88 million dollars and 23 million lives a year or whatever. You know, you get some information into that. But I'm trying to predict drought in Africa. And I'm doing it with data mining. Now, data mining is, and I'm like you, I still don't know what data mining is. Okay. So, uh, and you might say, oh, it's just too difficult to explain. I hope not. I mean, I hope we can figure out a way how we can get the public to understand. And, and, then, and then I would outline your challenges. But I'm just starting, you know, and I don't really know what's going to happen. But, and I don't know if you can say this, but it would be helpful if you could say, but it could be this. And it could be that. And my research is going to be looking at this to see if there's a relationship between X and Y, whatever that is. And you also made a reference to um, this is real similar to something else that already happens. You know what I'm talking about? There's a data mining and some things. Oh, yeah, there's data mining in other uh, areas. Yeah, so well, that might be an easy way of explaining that. You know, they use data mining in whatever they use it in. To do this, okay, and I would like to do something similar with drought. Nobody has done that yet, and, and maybe there's interesting reasons why people haven't done. Maybe the data is incomplete, or maybe no, we really think the data is out there. This is really, really exciting. All we have to do is figure out how to do this. So try to. Here's, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little anecdote. I once was interviewing a a, uh, a scientist who was saying, "Yeah, it could be this, could be that." You know, I'm thinking of all this stuff. And he could tell that I was getting exasperated. And he says, so what's your problem? And I says, well, you know, my readers just want to know what the answer is. You know, I feel like I need to come back in five years and re-interview you, and then I have a story. And he told me probably the best advice I ever had. He said, no, you're thinking about this all wrong. I think, he says, I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but I'm going to tell you how to do your job. He says, I think you should approach what you do the way I approach my science, which is science is the greatest mystery that's out there. It's, chock full of wonderful mysteries and i think you should write my story like you're writing a mystery story you know you take people down show them the clues take them down the different paths where, where it could be and if you don't resolve it at the end you know you can end with kind of a well stay tuned until next year because i 
I'm doing more, you know, or stay tuned for the next installment of this exciting, mysterious science story. So I think the fact that we don't know something is very storyable if we're if we tell this 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 the story of pursuing that answer. That's a real important answer, right? Because I'm trying to predict drought in Africa. Man, you can't beat that for a that's interesting and important. That's, uh, I don't know if this would stray too far from the research component, but I'm interested in knowing how predicting drought, like what what advantage, I mean, I know being able to predict it would be great, but what kind of steps can be put in place to... Yeah, you feel um, like I know what's coming, well, what do I do? Right, I, I was just wondering, uh, do you know anything about that or what can you put in place to help prevent it? So in the agricultural section, so if you know drought is happening, so we will plan for the irrigation, we will plan for the type of crop that we are you know, going to put there, and we will plan for the budget of food that the town will get. So all of this like the, by the decision making that we want to have based on the condition that we have. But if you know that the drought is coming, so we will become prepared for the agriculture, we will become prepared the economy. So that was an excellent question, and it was an excellent answer. I'm trying to predict drought in Africa. This is important because we would be able to decide what kind of crops to plant that year. How does our different irrigation, you know, help answer that question? Why is this important? What you're doing? It seems incredibly important. I want to know more about your story. I think it's really interesting what you're doing. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about the fact that, well, I'm just starting, okay? Because you're pursuing an interesting question. And, and if you can telegraph why it's important, and if you can telegraph some of the things that you're, you're doing to figure that out. Because my thought is, how do you predict drought? Well, must be you think there's a way of doing it, or you're hoping there is. So, good stuff. I had a reaction to the, to the content. You did a good job. You, you know, you spoke from some of your notes that you really re communicated with us. Um, I've been in agriculture my entire life. I grew up on a farm. And the weather man always predicts the weather. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. And that's part of science. There's a probability distribution around any prediction. And in this country or in Africa, it's, a, it's an even more complicated challenge than you're laying out because once you build a model and you think there's a relationship, there's a probability distribution around the predicted how. So, you know, we, we rely on the farmer's almanac here. What's this winter going to be like? Was it like last winter? Predictions are high that it will be, but it may not be. So, what do you do under those circumstances? And particularly, um, as scientists, how do we communicate with our client farmers that there is this, there's an odds, there's a probability surrounding our prediction. And then, you know, it may come true and it may not. We can give you some idea of how reliable we think it is. But really, we have to figure out what to do to help them cope with that uncertainty. Which is an even bigger challenge. Uh, I had a big, uh, when I was really young, I lived three years in Northeast Brazil. And in that part of the world, sometimes there will be not one dry season or one drought in one dry season. Sometimes there will be two, dr two droughts one year after the next. But it doesn't always happen every year. So that there's a certain probability. This, it comes back to cowpeas and, and sorghum. You know, if, if you knew there was going to be this kind of drought every year, then you'd have a cropping pattern with much more predictability. But if, in, if one year you get a lot of rain, and then the next year you don't, that, that makes it much more complicated. It's just kind of a reaction from a client standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. And you're trying to figure out how to make that more predictable. Yeah, yeah. 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 we're using lots of data yeah. Yeah, to make the best prediction that we can. And yeah, that's really true. It's always a prediction. Exactly. And the question.
climate change, the, the extreme events are increasing in some point and are decreasing in other points. So that's another problem. So in some places of the world, you have lots of like extreme hot days, and in the other parts, you have extreme cold days. So everything, like in Michigan, you will never, it's the safest place to live. <laughs> you will never have that. We have tornadoes once in a while. Nothing. So it's a very, tornadoes. Since I have been here, I haven't heard of the big event. But yeah, so they're just making jokes that Michigan is the safest place to live. But yeah, really, so for in Michigan, for instance, we have lots of heavy rains that we didn't have. We're experiencing extreme winters. We didn't have all of, all of this is climate change and global warming. So in in the case of our so journalists, they, they really have a very important task to really inform others, publics, that global warming is happening. So he should do some adaptation, mitigation, so about, about the farmers, they should be educated and learn what is this stuff. So it's really important. Good, good, because again, uh, your passion is going to inform your story. Mm -hmm. One question I had just from a it's a technical background. Um, do you do you know how you're going to visualize the data that you're capturing? Uh, we will use a hydrologic model to that the input of the model will be the different parameters and the climate change that we have observed data for it and we have the predicted data for it. So we will, we will use, I don't know how much familiar are you with the climate change models and the data. So we will process that data and bioprojected in the future, like for 10 years. And that will be the input of our hydrological model beside the soil, landscape, water, and all of this information. So that will be the input of our model. And uh, based on the output, we will use some budget, fund logic models and stuff to generate the, the final result that we want. So that's how we, and we use our map. I don't know if you're familiar with SWAT, the hydrological model. Mm -hmm. So it's implemented to ArcGIS, and based on that, we visualize the data. We use uh, our view in uh, journalism. Mm -hmm. It's really helpful. Right, we pull in some disparate data sets to find some intersections of drinking water wells and contaminated sites. Yeah, that's cool. Well, let me not next. Or would you like to go? Um, I doesn't matter. <laughs> Are you catching up? Trying to. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the front so yeah. everybody. I like Great idea. <laughs> okay. well, my story is a little different because I'm retired. I spent forty years facing the challenge that you are facing and uh, of doing research and communicating the results to clients and to scholars. And I was very fortunate that I learned from a lot of the pioneers in my department who really taught me the technique. And then I had a great group of people to work with, and we were very successful. We, as a group in our department, had brought in over $100 million of grants over a, a 40 years. And one of the biggest challenges I faced in that 40 years of work was trying to, for my own research and for that of the colleagues I was working with, to get them to create what we call elevator versions of our work. What is an elevator version? When you're riding up the elevator with the minister who happens to come in, you want to have a short version of what you're doing communicate to the minister or to the director and even more important if someone gets in the elevator who's paying for your research you really need to have an elevator version to communicate to them not the sophisticated design 
But as we're trying to focus in this workshop on what are we really doing here and what where are the odds we're going to come up with something that's really going to pay off. So I faced that my whole career. I got ready to retire. And I said, you know, we've been creating these elevator versions our whole life. We've been doing the scholarships. We've been doing the journal articles and publications. And what's going to re remain of the legacy of my work and the legacy of all the pioneers that I learned from in my department? And it turns out that our department had decided for budgetary and other reasons to drop the emeritus section from the website. So there would have been no record on the website of any of the work of my emeritus colleagues or of me. So before retiring, I set out a project that said, I want to enhance the access and the availability of the, what we did. I want to have all these elevator versions particularly so that people might go and see what we did. That's been my project for the last four years. And I've made a lot of progress. Um, I don't want to go into all of those details, but one of the hardest things to do has been to come up with short versions of it. It's now in a website. I mean, I've helped the department build a much more sophisticated website. It has tremendous more detail and content, but it has all of these content in little pockets, we call them tabs, so that they're more interesting. So that if you want to bore down to the details, you can find it. But you can find snippets first of what happened. And I had to, I had to try to find that for colleagues who were already deceased. One of the greatest joys I had in my experience of doing this was when I first came as a graduate student, I was assigned to a little desk area in a storeroom, an old storeroom. And my next door partner had just retired. Professor Carl Wright. He had worked 50 years in the department. And so I learned from him. As part of what I did in trying to rebuild his profile, so it was a presence for his work on the internet and on the website, I found in the archive a videotape in the MSU archive. He had left his materials, he's deceased. There's this videotape of him being interviewed about 30 years ago. I was able to get the MSU library to digitize that video, and that's now on his website, on his his section of the America's website. So that was that was the kind of thing that I have I've had many little experiences like that in trying to help rebuild people's lives and put them out there in a digital format. But the, the upshot of this is. Uh, I'm trying to learn how to condense the message so that we can attract people to come and read about what these people did, and not just the people in the past. But an interesting side effect of my work has been the current faculty in the department began to complain because the profiles of the emeritus faculty were looking richer than the profiles of the current faculty. Good. <laughs> Good, maybe it'll spark them. <laughs> so now we've had to, my job has gotten bigger because I've had to help current faculty do the same thing. The biggest challenge in all of this is our scholarship missions tend to dictate. And the, the job of communicating your scholarship to your client audience, which is your profession, and to the journals is very is very significant and it's very important for us in the university. But particularly from my experience, you don't bring in a hundred million dollars worth of grants by not proving to the donors that you're doing a good job. And you don't just prove you're doing a good job by giving them one one narrow window of your scholarship. You've got to figure out ways to give them different images or insight into that. And that's even more so, I believe, true today, because today there's so many more ways to communicate and get your message out. It makes our challenge even greater to really reach that connection uh, to convince people what we're really doing has some value, 
with many different perspectives. So that's what I'm working on, and I'm here today particularly to try to learn how to condense these things in, in more innovative ways as we go forward in the future. One of the one of the biggest challenges I face is getting my colleagues interested in doing this because most of them are under tremendous pressure, and the pressure is increasing every day for them to succeed because they've communicated with their journal scholarship audience. And and to, to, from my standpoint, from my experience of having worked 40 years, is that we won't continue to be successful if we just do that. Uh, some of us will, but not very many of us. And more importantly, uh, the donors who are out there who are willing to fund our research, there are many of them. But we're not going to attract more of them if we can't communicate to them well what what it is we're really working on that will help them in their mission. So I'm I'm here to to learn more about how to how to accomplish that, even though I'm at the end of my career. Thank you. Good job. Comments, thoughts. I really like your slow pace. Here, it's like a, um, keep, like hear every word you said. Because a lot of people, when speaking, they'll have, just have a sudden burst of speaking way fast for a few seconds, and then go back. So, what? Well, what? Well, you just said. So, I like how it was consistently one pace the entire time. Well, it put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm sure we'll, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm sure we'll um, go over and probably have a condensed our stories and things like that, but um, <clears throat> we're probably going to be expanding on them mm -hmm. also for the condensed versions. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Starl format for interviewing. Um, at, at In my program, when you go to interviews, yeah, the situation text actually is all unlearning. That has been really helpful for me to be able to kind of take something that was really complex situation and be able to answer it in a more concise way, or at least frame it in a more concise way. So I don't know if that's something. What is, but, what is the acronym? Um, STARL. S T. S T A R L. Oh, I haven't heard of that. So you explain what the situation is, um, what the task is or was, what action you took. What the result was and what the major learnings yeah. were from yeah. that. Is that by Google that I'll find a ton of information? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so my thoughts is you you also have an unfair advantage yeah, in that how um, uh, so you you've lived your story, you are the voice of authority. Okay, you have you know, it struck me it was, it, it, maybe this is too strong, but it also struck me that you retired and then and it was almost like a panic. All this body of work that I and my colleagues have left behind might get, might get lost. And um, to the extent that you have volunteered a tremendous amount of your time and your effort. So that's good to show that because it shows that you think that this is really, really important, really, really personal and passionate. I think, I mean, just, just some kind of minor two up things. Uh, and it might have been just simply because of the context, we're kind of in an artificial context here. But I, I thought um, you took too long to get into um, into that piece, you know. And, and I'd like to see you start out, you know, I retired after 40 years and I had this concern and now I'm going off and doing this stuff. Um, I think it's okay to put in all that elevator speech stuff that you had before, but maybe not start with that, you know. And again, and you were talking to, uh, you were talking very personally to our audience here. And, I guess we don't really know exactly know where your audience is going to be. But I can tell you a really great audience that you should be speaking to, and that's to this MOOC that we're developing. I mean, you're perfect. So one of the, one of the pieces we have to sell on the MOOC is what should have other tickets. Okay. Well, here you are a retired scientist that's gone through all this, and you're very, very passionate. And, and I, I hope we can capture some of that um, to use, you know, even with your permission. Um, the other thing too is, um, oh, you know, when you told a tale about finding that video in the archive, that's a nice little story, you know, that you know could have been lost or something like that. Mm -hmm. I would, I would push that up 
towards the front of your presentation a little bit. And, um, and, and here's a technical guy, and I don't know how to do this, but probably he does. You know, if, even if we have a little clip from that video, we might be able to work it into your video clip by the time we're done in two days or thinking about that too, thinking about, you know, some of those assets. I just, I was uh, deeply fascinated because I'm taking courses in agriculture and when I was just sitting one evening and I went on YouTube and I searched for Norman Borlaug and I watched a whole video on Norman Borlaug. And that whole video of Norman Borlaug helped me understand many things how the green revolution happened and all the other things, how, how the, the history of what I'm actually doing now. So it is very important for us sometimes to go back in history and try to understand from that perspective and how we have reached here and who were the pioneers and what they contributed and how this occurred, etc. Et so I think it was now the only thing is that Norman Borlaug is the only person who came up. But there are hundreds of oh, yeah. so it's a workforce. Yeah. Norman Bulldog himself is not here. So this is a really important project. I was it completely resonated with me. And then but for the MOOC thing also, I thought maybe it is also a good idea to start the MOOC with the history. Because we have to build on history that who who they watch for the whole thing to actually happen in the first place. That's very important. So we maybe to start. What is a movement? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. was going <laughs> to I'm, I'm outside the word, the term MOOC um, is relatively you new. Know, it means a massive open and online course. You know, uh, so the MOOClet is a uh, less massive. <laughs> is, is derivative of that. And essentially, it's uh, one of the uh, characteristics of MOOCs typically is that it's a, a synchronous or there's some synchronous events that occur where you know Thursday at eight o'clock there's gonna be a live webinar and that webinar is a part of the MOOC. You know, so I mean MOOC, but with the MOOC lit is the its focus is less asynchronous that the content is there, consume it when you need to. And that's one of the things, one of the aims for this course is we understand the audience is people who aren't media, they don't have come from a media production background. So to be able to get the skills, and not just from you know from a technical standpoint, but also this translational component, the skills that you need when you need it, so to speak. So um, that's the term the MOOC is. There won't be many, um, there may be some um, asynchronous events, but essentially you'll be able to come and get what you know. It's kind of interesting to me too, because there's a lot of this interest cropping up a lot of different places, but there's a lot of different programs. And one of the things that I hope we can do is just build a library of assets that we can use in a lot of different programs. In fact, I plan on be less than use some of the material we have in my journalism classes. Too. Do you guys sense that too? There's this growing interest among scientists and researchers to communicate. And part of what's driving that too, I think, are the broader impact requirements of our grant applications. That's not, and, and, and from my perspective, that's a good thing. You know, if you want to get a grant, you have to be able to communicate. They go, hey, us folks over here in Commerce, we'd love to help you communicate. Yeah, I, I was saying we're all thinking about the MOOC, I think. Content. I, I thought I mentioned that to you yesterday that I think your perspective would be very interesting. And also, something I've heard echoed from colleagues in, um, at Sokinini University in Tanzania is talking about how you know their, their professors are retiring and they're bringing all these new, fresh faces. But what about their legacy? And I think that's a compelling story. You work 40, 50 years. And, 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 and devote your life to something, you know, and the university has the benefit of receiving over $150 million in grants, you know, the legacy of that should be captured. So, yeah. Very good. And Shereen. Okay. You want to say your name right? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not a researcher. 
Um, I'm a um, graduate student in journalism, actually, uh, with the international reporting concentration. Um, so what I do with GCFSI is um, any communications work that needs to go through. Um, that's my job. And so one thing I did back in March was um, we had what was called these student innovation grants, and I just updated where GCFSI um, funded different um, classes or different um, groups of students and faculty from different universities, um, including um, University of Florida, Purdue, um, one getting a university in the Netherlands. Um, so my job was to um, um, interview the um, anyone from the group who was in charge of that, um, and then just put brief uh, 200 word updates for our uh, monthly newsletters. Um, so I'm going back much, and I do apologize because this wasn't work, so I'm just I just don't remember what I wrote. Um, but um, one of them, so from Purdue University, uh, we funded them to do a work on a hydroponics uh, project, um, and it was with the uh, Village of Hope organization that operates a school and an adult training center in Haiti, um, and uh, the students. Uh, um, it was mostly graduate students, I believe. They um, um, tried to establish an agricultural system that could provide um, human foodstuffs for the school and practical training for the Haitian students in applied life sciences um, and uh, just a tr an agricultural training. Um, so that was one thing. And then um, University of Florida did something similar um, with hydroponic gardening, um, but focused in um, Kenya, uh, mostly in the Nairobi area. Um, so it's just, um, so basically my job was to um, write uh, what, what they dictated to me, but make it in a way that um, anyone could understand it, get through the scientific jargon. Um, and um to make people care essentially because um the gcfsi newsletters they get um sent to all the other um fellow to usaid and all the usaid um, um higher education solution network teams um, which is eight universities msu included but so it, it gets sent out to them as well and those, those hgsm labs they also include um Texas A&M, um, MIT, College of William & Mary, and others. So it's just a big um, sort of cohort. So just keeping everyone updated. And then um, each um, HESM lab has a focus on how to essentially prove the world in um, MSU does gardening. <laughs> uh, not gardening, uh, agriculture, excuse me. Um, yeah, I'm a researcher. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, guess, uh, I think that was good. What, what do you mean by GCF? The Global Center for Food Systems Innovation. Yeah, that's a good reminder for all of us watching the afternoons. Yeah. So basically, your story is the story of the translational stuff, right? I suppose. <laughs> well, I think I think you have a decision to make, um, and, and it, it, it could easily go either way. Uh, one thing, if, if you want to work on a story, you could work on a story about a particular piece of research that you want to translate. Okay, uh -huh. but where you started from is fine too. This is what I do for a living. I have to translate. I have to translate all this garbage for everybody else to understand. <laughs> now, you don't want to say it that way, but. But try to break it down like that. And, and one of the things, because you've already done this type of work, right? It might be helpful to say, boy, one of the biggest challenges that I've had was X. I couldn't understand that, you know? And finally, it clicked. It came out with an analogy. I found a photograph. I put together, you know, whatever you did to help communicate this very difficult concept. Or maybe there are three significant translational issues that you were able to overcome in the context of your job. Um, and you mentioned things like, uh, you know, it's just things that catch my ear. You mentioned some hydroponic research. 
Yeah. I need to tell them, I want to know about that, you know. But that's all I got was, was some hydroponics research. Well, what do you mean hydroponics? What were you doing? You know, what, what, what did they find out? What did they discover? Um, and that might yeah. have, going down that path may have been interesting. It also might have taken you away from the central issue that you wanted to tell. Um, yeah. And that's kind of up to you. You have to, you have to decide where your story is. And if your story is, is my job as a translator, tell us what you've done to translate, you know, because I'd like to know. Yeah, and I'm um, I'm actually in um, Dr. Takahashi's class, and that's exactly what we're focusing on. And actually, that's the reason why I have to leave early today because class is right at three. <laughs> but um, it was just uh, really getting the audience to understand, and then maybe through understanding, caring about scientific research. So good. Hoping that's good. Good to more of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to take a little break here? Or we want to yeah, well, I, know, I know we're running behind the schedule, but uh, yeah, why don't we take a break? There's some coffee and some um, water and some bagels outside. Mm -hmm. um, and um, how about we reconvene in like five minutes? Restrooms, if you need to go to the restroom, if you go outside this week, um, just to just past the elevators, the women's bathrooms on your left. If you go around the corner. Um, you'll see the men's restaurants as well. So, so I don't have a gal or a whistle, but great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you had a comment? No, I just had a question more. Um, you're, in, you're at the beginning, I'm at the end of a challenge, the same challenge in many ways, and that is I was a scientist and I had to help produce the results, but I also had to, for my own work, as well as that of my colleagues, convince them of the importance of, of trying to translate their work so others could understand it. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a big challenge. I don't know whether I succeeded or not. And, and I don't know, today I, I'm afraid my job would be harder today than it was 20 years ago or 30 when I really got going because of the disciplinary pressures yeah. that our scientists face. I think the problem is getting worse. And yeah. I've experienced it because I now have put onto our departmental website every research grant that we get. There's a project on there. So the scientists get visibility mm -hmm. and I get a little bit of data and we create a, a posting and I can't get them to write a summary. <laughs> I yeah. have to try to write a summary somehow. Okay. Yeah. A few will do it, but most won't even take the time to write the summary. And but somebody yeah, there's, else. There's a lot of things that. First of all, some people aren't good at doing that. That's fine. Second of all, many researchers don't care about it. It's not going to get me tenure. It's not going. You know. I, what 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 what's it what's it. Um, some researchers are really good at it, and some are really interested in interacting with the public as well. Um, but I think it, I'm, I'm hoping that, that institutional pressure is changing somewhat in the sense that the pressure is to communicate. And I think where that's going to get solved, or at least addressed to some extent, is in um, the funders' requirements. You want money from us? You better have a plan to communicate what you want. You know, and, and I think that might be the hope. Of driving some of that change, but I agree with you. It's really, you know, and, and I can't really blame the scientists. I didn't get into this because I wanted to communicate. <laughs> I love the science. I want to be out here in this field. I want to experiment. This is what I do. You know, it's you know, and um, I think the problem with a lot of the scientists, and it's not their fault, is they're trained to be so formal, use the passive voice, and it just. So if you're a scientist or an academic, then yes, that makes sense. I can understand it, but if you're going to the average Joe who's already easily distracted with anything that's not science or mathematic or anything important. Anything on YouTube. <laughs> pretty much. You're speaking to me right now. <laughs> yeah, so um, then it's really hard. And I have to be honest, I science the, the only science I did in undergrad was meteorology 101. Okay. And I didn't really care that I was late to class because I just would not drag. I, I'm, that's why I was a music major in my undergrad. But it's just my mind just 
is it why it's a for me you have to dumb down the science so but I do acknowledge that it is important but I'm also an academic that I even though I don't understand it and I I don't want to be anywhere near the research I know it's important so I want to get it because I hope I'm making sense mm -hmm. it's, no. it's not that it's not that like as an academic I acknowledge that it's important we should care although my brain I'm the opposite brain <laughs> of science <laughs> well, I want to address that a little bit because because that is a challenge that we have, and, and I think there's two ways to look at this problem. One is just to get to make help the scientists be better communicators. Mm -hmm. Many of them will never be excellent, but at least get them to want to care about. It. But the other thing is to help the non-scientists not be so overwhelmed by the science. And part of that may be science education, but I think a lot of that is just insecurity. Guess what? Here's a dirty little secret. You're going to hate this one. Yeah. Science isn't so hard to write about. It really isn't. It's not that complex. No. If you look at a newspaper, what is the most complex story in the newspaper? I say probably politics. Okay. I would say sports. Sports are an incredibly complex, difficult story to tell. And you know why it's easy for us? We all have that language. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was first and ten on the twenty. If you have no context of football, what in the heck does that mean? <laughs> right? okay. But we all know, well, maybe you not non US sports fans would, would not know it. Yeah. And in fact, that's an exercise I do in my class. I say, okay, here's a, you know, I'll give them the Rose Bowl play where we stopped the run. Okay, describe that play to someone who's never heard of football. Okay. It'll take them three pages. <laughs> okay, now I'll write it like you would do it here for a US audience and I'll give them two sentences. <laughs> So and so I think I think yes, science is complex and it is intimidating, but it should be less so. A non-science person can master it, can understand it. it. Takes a while, and the biggest thing is, is you gotta ask a lot of questions. It, yeah. yeah, sometimes the scientists might be a little impatient with your questions, but you shouldn't feel badly about that. You know? Yeah, and I have to admit, I'm still even with all these updates, I did, I'm sure I'm still not sure what hydroponics even. Oh. It's, but I'm trying to research it. It's you know, it's definitely a learning process and just a lot of. Okay, I get set up here. What do we think? Oh, sorry. That's all right. That's all right. We can continue yeah. after. So I think I recorded the physics that they should have. So going to something in the soil. And the soil is on the soil. Yeah. So like soil. Yeah. No soil. No soil. But the other thing is, is don't forget that we're going to have Julie and Steve in there. I don't know if you want them sitting side by side or okay. standing or how you want to handle that. But, um, right. Um, what else? Yeah. Yeah. Well, by that time, just like that. By that time, yeah, they can come over here and the focus can be down this way. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's what you want to do. To, or do we have Julie, Julie and Steve, we want to capture the move because I'm raising it as an issue. Um, so I don't really know if we want to capture that as an interaction with the students mm -hmm. or just a full screen like that. Or do it one way and sit over. Okay. But it's hard for me to get Julie and Steve over here. So yeah, they're taking down the signs, the painters. Oh, okay. We finally figured out where the women sit. Where's the men? So if you pass that and keep going and you'll make a left and then it'll be uh, to the left before you go into that that'll yeah. be a set of offices. Oh, all I'm saying is we need to capture Julian C. Right. So, uh, we are not to do that. So. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So maybe I'll move the camera on that side. Yeah. But when they do the final story, we want them to fill the screen, right? As opposed to being having the table and things there. Or is it? So, um, you mean in terms of um, like a close up? Well, yeah. I guess I, I thought. That was more what we were doing rather than capturing the room. Yep. We want to capture one person telling their story. Yeah, that's that's what I've been doing, just capturing folks in one person. Okay. This camera goes in pretty tight. Yep. No, it sounds like you had to figure it out and you just let's get out of here. No, I mean, I need to hook up here too. Can I disconnect this from you? Uh, that's actually, uh, that's recording as well. Oh, so you, oh you I, need to do, I, need, I need to do my presentation. What's sure. the best way to do on that? Yeah, just song. Yeah. Yeah, you can just hook up to that to the um, HDMI. Excuse me, I need to leave early today at 4 30 a.m. class. Okay. Do it. Stay when you can. All right, put this on period. Yeah. Okay. Do you have it on dual monitor? Um, I don't know. I'm, Is this what you're seeing on your screen? No, that's not what I'm